Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, my name is Dan Aukis. I'm at Arizona State University. I uh, study in the field of robotics, and I'm pleased to present Josh Bongard, who is going to be presenting um, on computer designed organisms. So, um, Josh, whenever you are ready, uh, feel free to share your screen. Sure. Great. Thanks very much, Daniel. And uh... Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, I apologize I wasn't able to be here this morning uh, due to teaching responsibilities, but uh, looking forward to interacting with uh, you during the rest of the conference. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, some work on computer designed organisms, and uh, this is some joint work between my group here at the University of Vermont. Uh, we are computer scientists and roboticists. Um, the bulk of the computational design work that I'm going to talk about today, this was work by my uh, PhD student, uh, Sam Kriegman. Um, and we created a collaboration with two uh, of our biology colleagues at Tufts, Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin. Uh, Michael runs the uh, Allen Discovery Center on Regenerative uh, biology at Tufts. So I will try and field questions about the uh, biological side of things as best I can, but if any of the questions are over my head, I will forward you to uh, Doug uh, and Michael. Um, I can also, uh, I can see the chat, I can see the Zoom chat and the Discord as well, so if people have questions, feel free to type it in, and if I can get to them during presentation, happy to, otherwise I'll take, uh, take some questions at the end. Okay, so um, this is sort of a, a snapshot of how this process works. Um, what I'm going to show you is uh, a machine learning method that is able to automatically design uh, the 3D geometry and the distribution of materials uh, in a simulated creature uh, in a physics engine. I'm going to show you how we couple that physics, uh, that physics engine with the machine learning algorithm to seek uh, good designs. And uh, then these designs are fabricated out of not traditional robotic materials like uh, metals and plastics and ceramics, but instead uh, these robot designs are built up using frog cells. Okay, so just to give you a sense of what these uh, CDOs or Xenobots look like, um, there's a Xenobot there. Uh, it's uh, called a Xenobot because it's using uh, cells taken from Xenopus lavis, the African uh, clawed frog. Uh, you can see that these little creatures are about a millimeter uh, across. So before I talk about uh, Xenobots themselves, just sort of situating our work within the larger uh, uh, ambit of uh, synthetic biology, obviously our species has been manipulating biological materials to suit our ends for thousands and thousands of years. Um, there's an easy way to do this, which is just influence which organisms breed which with other ones. And you can obviously make some pretty radical changes, but it takes uh, thousands or tens of thousands of years uh, to achieve that. So uh, in the last few decades, genetic engineering has come an extremely uh, long way. It's obviously become an, an incredibly powerful uh, technology. But at the moment, at least, there are a number of uh, challenges that have yet to be overcome in uh, genetic engineering. The first one is to identify a desirable trait, like excreting uh, uh, diesel fuel and figuring out what genetic manipulation needs to be made to the target organism, like in this case, uh, E. coli bacteria, to affect or incorporate that behavior uh, or that trait into the organism. There's a third way um, that we know of to manipulate uh, living material, which is to influence the environment in which the organism grows and not to necessarily uh, manipulate its genetics. So uh, again, our ancestors have been doing this for a long time. Uh, we can take the normal genotype to phenotype developmental trajectory of an apple tree. And if we influence the developmental signals that the growing apple tree uh, gets during development, you can espalier it into all sorts of uh, interesting and, and aesthetic uh, patterns. This works pretty well for plants, which are very pliable and obviously uh, alter how they grow in response to lots of different environmental signals. Um, but animals, on the other hand, seem much less permissive to this kind of manipulation. At least that's what we thought until relatively recently. Turns out that you can actually espalier an organism uh, as well. And here's one example, uh, again, from our Tufts colleagues. Um, in this case, we have a, a normally developing tadpole. Uh, back in 2013, uh, Doug Blackiston uh, took a adult frog eye, which you see uh, circled here in red, and explanted it uh, ectopically in the wrong place. 
onto the, uh, t uh, the notochord of the tadpole. Not only did this not uh, kill the tadpole, the eye spontaneously sent out uh, neural connections, as did the notochord, and the uh, eye and notochord uh, were able to connect neurally. This tadpole grew into a perfectly healthy frog. It was not only healthy, but the frog could actually use this third eye on its back to influence uh, phototactic behavior, so the ability to, to swim towards uh, a light source. So this kind of um, not genetic manipulation, but anatomical manipulation has actually been known for quite a while. And what we explored in the project I'm gonna talk about next is not a human devising how to rearrange the, the biological material of an organism, but figuring out how to get an AI to figure out how to do this to produce a new kind of organism that does something uh, useful. So uh, our collaboration with the Tufts group started about two years ago through a, a jointly funded project. And at the beginning of this funded project, we were on our weekly Skype call and we were showing videos back and forth of what the two groups at Tufts uh, and UVM could do. And on one of the early calls, we showed them this video. What you're wa watching is a physics engine. And inside this physics engine, we've applied a machine learning algorithm that is training this soft quadrupedal robot uh, to walk. This is our normal, uh, the normal area that my group works in, which is soft uh, robotics. You can see that the brain of this robot is expanding and contracting the voxels or the 3D pixels that make up the simulated uh, robot. The next week, the Tufts group showed us this image, uh, which had us scratching our heads. Basically, Doug Blackiston uh, took uh, epithelial cells from Xenopus lavis and put those uh, skin cells together to match the 3D shape of our quadrupedal robot. So what you're looking at is a uh, not a Xenobot, but a Xeno sculpture. So this particular sculpture has no way to move. It's just made of passive skin materials, uh, pa passive skin tissue. Um, the Tufts group told us, however, that they could also include uh, heart muscle tissue or uh, myocardiocytes. So heart muscle tissue um, is, uh, is a bundle of cells that will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume, not unlike what they saw in our soft uh, robot video. If you take frog heart muscle tissue and combine it together in the shape of an adult frog, that tissue will uh, communicate with, with itself and coordinate its actions so that all the cells increase and decrease in volume together, which is a good thing for a heart because it causes the heart to act as a pump. Okay. So, uh, so we, we, at the start of this project, what we, what we started to do is to figure out how a machine learning algorithm could consider different ways of combining frog skin and frog heart muscle tissue to create uh, a new kind of organism built from these materials that could do something useful. So what we started with is to formulate an objective function. So a, a, a quantitative way for uh, the computer to evaluate any given Xenobot design. Um, I won't go into the math, but basically the objective function uh, selected for simulated Xenobots that were uh, relatively small and could move as fast as possible over a 10 second period. Okay. We then told our machine learning algorithm that it could build candidate designs out of two types of Lego bricks, uh, blue bricks and red bricks, as you see here. The machine learning algorithm knows nothing about cellular physiology or the anatomy of frogs. It just knows something about the local properties of these uh, different uh, voxels. It knows that the uh, blue voxels are passive and they will be passively deformed by the red voxels, which will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume. This, uh, this machine learning algorithm starts by basically, it starts with a random, uh, a random configuration of blue and red voxels. And hopefully I can get this video to play for you. Here we go. You'll notice that the red voxels are increasing and decreasing in volume, but they're increasing and decreasing in volume in different phases with one another. As I mentioned, if you put heart muscle tissue together in the shape of a heart, they will spontaneously synchronize. 
but it turns out um, that if you if you rearrange heart muscle tissue it will not necessarily synchronize we didn't know how uh, how or whether it would synchronize at all so in our uh, in our machine learning algorithm we just assume that any red uh, voxels would increase and decrease in volume at a random phase offset from one another so this makes a particularly different design, uh, a particularly difficult design problem to solve, because uh, in this case now the the computer is trying to build a machine that consistently produces a desired behavior, moving uh, quickly and efficiently, but it's being built out of uncertain parts, parts that have uh, some randomness to them. So um, one way to think about this is um, if you were, if you had a whole bunch of human rowers and those rowers could all, would all row at the same frequency, so heart muscle tissue, at least in this frog species, has more or less the same uh, actuation frequency. So all the human rowers are going to row at the same rate, but if you put them in a boat, they're all going to row at uh, different phase offsets from one another. You can have as many of these human rowers as you want. You can put them anywhere you want in your boat, and you need to design the 3D shape of the boat and place o uh, rowers in that boat so that the boat goes straight uh, forward as quickly as possible. It's an extremely hard design problem to solve uh, manually, but it turns out that uh, machine learning can do a pretty good job at this. How does it solve this problem? As I mentioned, it starts by creating a random uh, design and evaluating the quality of this design. In this case, clearly the design is not very good. This simulated Xenobot doesn't move at all. This machine learning algorithm uh, then creates a different random design, like the one that you see here. And you can see that it's manipulating, um, not just it's altering not just the 3D shape, but also the distribution of skin and heart muscle tissue. This one also doesn't move uh, very much at all. So the computer discards this one and repeats this process uh, over a number of random uh, designs. And uh, what happens is something like the following. This is a video actually taken from a different experiment by some of my colleagues. Uh, I don't know if Rob McCurdy is here. I know he's one of the organizers of this uh, event. The machine learning algorithm that we're using here is known as an evolutionary algorithm. Evolutionary algorithms have been around since the 1960s. Um, they're really pretty simple idea. You start with a population of random solutions to your problem. In this case, they are random uh, simulated robots. And I'm just going to fast forward a little bit here. So you can actually see this evolutionary algorithm um, uh, in action. So here's a, a ran here are a couple of random designs. What you're seeing at each snapshot, each video snapshot here, is the best robot in the population at that time. I'll just pause for a moment. As I mentioned, we start with a population of random solutions. The computer assigns a score, how quickly the robot moves, to each of these robots. Robots that move uh, slower than average are deleted. The survivors that moved faster than the population average are retained, and the computer randomly selects one of those survivors, makes a copy of that design, and, uh, and introduces a random variation to the shape or the distribution of these uh, material uh, properties. Very, very simple. Uh, you can see why it's called an evolutionary algorithm. One of the beautiful things about evolutionary algorithms is despite their simplicity, they tend to produce pretty functional designs. So again, here um, we were selecting, they were selecting for the speed of locomotion. Um, you get some pretty nice designs. You get designs that kind of look like things you might see in nature. Um, you get things that kind of look like, if you squint, they kind of look like quadrupeds or uh, ungulates or mammals. But you also get designs that are also uh, very different from what you might see in, ne in nature or the way you might go about creating a traditional robot uh, design. So that's an evolutionary algorithm. In the video that you're seeing here, they assume that the parts are uh, deterministic. In our, in, our, in our space here, we're assuming that the heart muscle tissue is not so uh, reliable. Turns out, however, that uh, with enough generations, the evolutionary algorithm in our case was able to produce this uh, simulated design, which has mostly uh, heart muscle tissue on the ventral or the bottom surface 
of this simulated xenobot. It's got passive tissue on the dorsal or the top uh, half of the, the robot. And it's got this particular shape that uh, biases the mass distribution in just the right way that the random action of the heart muscle tissue uh, causes the robot to move forward. So the, the shape of this robot and the distribution of materials taken together is collectively de-randomizing the random action of the elements that this robot is, from which this robot is made up. Okay, that's the, that's the design side. So now I'll talk a little bit about the, the manufacture, the fabrication uh, process. I know this is a computational fabrication symposium. Our fabrication process here is completely manual. So uh, Doug Blackiston, our microsurgeon, he's an extremely uh, accomplished microsurgeon. Uh, you can see him looking through the microscope here. Uh, these are very early frog blastula, so very, very early frog embryos. Um, Doug is very delicately, delicately cutting off the animal cap, which is the sort of top uh, of this blastula. The animal cap contains uh, stem cells that are fated to become epithelial or skin cells. So he's basically trying to get at the raw materials that make up uh, a xenobot. After he's extracted uh, all of these stem cells, um, they're all dissociated, so they're sort of free-floating. He sucks them up uh, in this uh, syringe and then extracts them back into a very small well, and you can see them all settling into the bottom of the well. So all of these very small white dots that you see, these are individual stem cells uh, faded to become epithelial cells. Um, the, this is, you're looking down into the bottom of a, uh, a petri dish and in that petri dish is just lukewarm pond water because of course that's the home of, of uh, this species of frog. One of the interesting things um, about doing this is the, in, the deaggregated epithelial cells will spontaneously try and um, be, quote unquote reboot um, multicellularity. They don't like being on their own and they will try and clump together into a group. So they're sort of reforming into this mass of skin cells, which over a few days are going to develop, uh, of stem cells, which over a few days are going to develop into skin cells. As they do, th this sort of raw material, Doug can take this and with uh, micro forceps and a micro cauterization tool, which you're going to see in a moment. He can come in and now try to sculpt the 3D shape of the Xenobot to what the AI, what the evolutionary algorithm came up with. So here you can see him cauterizing or burning away some of the skin cells on the ventral or the, the bottom surface uh, of this design. I've taken a few, these are a few snapshots of Doug building uh, a Xeno sculpture, not a Xenobot. As I mentioned, uh, he can combine skin and heart muscle tissue together. The way that he does that is to deposit one layer uh, of skin and then deposit another layer of stem cells that are fated to become uh, heart muscle tissue. Another layer of skin, another layer of muscle, another layer of skin. So basically building up 2D layers of alternating skin and muscle. And then by a subtractive manufacturer, by removing some of this material, he can sculpt the 3D shape and manipulate this uh, tis tissue distribution of skin and heart muscle tissue to some degree. It's not perfect, it's a little bit crude uh, at the moment and obviously completely uh, manual. This is, as you can see, a very labor, uh, very labor intensive uh, process. Okay, uh, at the end of this process, um, uh, in this case, we got the following Xenobot that you see in the bottom. Um, its shape doesn't match the shape of the uh, evolved design perfectly, and its way of moving also doesn't match the way of moving of the simulated design either, but the match is pretty good. So we did some statistical comparisons between similarity of shape and similarity of function, and it's much better than you would expect by chance. This is not a random bundle of skin and heart muscle tissue. If you take this Xenobot, which we're basically looking at from above, if you take it and, and flip it on its back, it will no longer move. So a simple way to demonstrate that its uh, form predicts its function. The shape dictates how it's going to move. 
Obviously, this Xenobot has a lot of differences compared to traditional robots. Um, the first and most obvious one is this Xenobot has no control policy. So there is no, um, there's no nervous tissue um, placed inside the Xenobot. So there is no obvious way for the Xenobot to coordinate its action. You can think of the Xenobot as, as more of a, a mechanical wind-up toy uh, for now. One of the nice thing, uh, one of the other nice things about an evolutionary algorithm, aside from its uh, simplicity, is that if you run an evolutionary algorithm multiple times, so if you rewind the evolutionary type tape, create another population of random designs, and run evolution forward again against the exact same objective function, so you want the exact same desired function, you often get very uh, different shapes. We ran uh, this evolutionary algorithm 100 times on a UVM supercomputer. It took several weeks to do so. And at the end of, those, those, uh, at the end of that three week period, we had these 100 distinct designs. Turns out that very few of these designs are actually manufacturable uh, using our, our manual construction method at the moment. So we went through each of these 100 designs and basically just applied a flow chart with a series of yes, no questions. First of all, does the design contain contiguous tissue regions? So if you had a very fine tiling of heart muscle and skin, that's not something that's currently buildable. Um, if it's a stable geometry, uh, meaning that once it's built and the Xenobot matures, that it will hold that shape over its lifetime, which for these Xenobots is, is about seven to 10 uh, days. Um, I forgot to mention also that these Xenobots don't have a digestive system. They have no way of taking in nutrients from their environment. So they basically, uh, they basically use the ATP that's already passively stored in their cells and burn away the ATP to produce this motion over this seven to 10 day uh, period. A stable geometry, um, although um, not, not all Xenobots will stay stable. Um, they, as I mentioned, the cells like to clump up. So they're basically always trying to reform into a sphere of spheres or a sphere of cells. So uh, it's not possible to have small concavities because they'll gradually fill those in. So there was some sort of geometrical considerations as well. If, uh, if there was contiguous tissue, the geometry was likely to stay stable over the seven to 10 uh, day period, and it had mostly passive tissue. So uh, if you go back to this design, we wanted our Xenobots to have a lot of passive tissue that we could use later on for other purposes. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, shortly. Okay. Um, it turns out that five out of these 100 designs were buildable and the clear winner out of those five was the one that I showed you uh, previously, this one here. Okay, so um, I've got just a few minutes left, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, potential applications. This is kind of a, a very new technique. Um, we reported this in the literature um, just uh, back in January. Um, we've got a website, cdorgs.github.io. You can go and have a look at some of the videos and images there. There's a link to the paper. There's also a link to the um, GitHub repo for those of you that want to try and evolve your own simulated uh, Xenobots. Um, so here's uh, one potential application, which is um, collaborative cleaning. So um, one of the things uh, that we noticed is that if we place multiple instances of the same Xenobot in a Petri dish, and you can see these large specks here, these are the Xenobots, and we distributed the bottom of the Petri dish with very small red glass pellets that are much smaller than the size of the Xenobots. The Xenobots will move around. You can see some of their movement traces that they leave in the debris field. Um, but it turns out that they seem to aggregate the material into clumps. So this is not what you would expect if you put a bunch of randomly moving machines into this uh, environment. I mentioned that the Xenobots don't have any nervous tissue, so it's hard to say that they're actually thinking or planning or deciding to work together. Um, but there do seem to be these spontaneous behaviors like collaborative cleaning that we did not select for. These are still the Xenobots that were selected just to move quickly on their own. Here's another, uh, here's another example of this collaborative action. Um, 
just because of the 3D shape of these Xenobots, sometimes if they collide with one another, they will just kind of mechanically lock together uh, for a short period of time and move about their combined uh, center of mass. You can see that in simulation and you can see that in the physical Xenobots down here. But it seemed that the physical Xenobots were attaching and staying together for a little bit longer than you might expect. So again, the hints of sort of some additional spontaneous uh, behavior. Here's another example. Here's an example of a single Xenobot. If you look at the bottom half of this video, you'll notice that this Xenobot uh, acts a little bit like a sheepdog. It seems to circle this small pellet and push this small pellet um, forward. Again, this was not something that we selected for in the evolutionary algorithm. We went back and actually evolved a xenobot to try and do this or uh, create a xenobot that would produce this sheepdog behavior. And it's very, very difficult to do. So that's an indirect way of saying that, uh, uh, indirect way of determining that this is very far from expected behavior. So it's very unlikely that this was just an artifact or a, a lucky example. This Xenobot seems to, in some sense, be in some way be sensing this pellet and modifying its behavior in reaction to what it senses. Again, it doesn't have any nervous tissue. How does it do that? Well, of course, the Xenobot is built up of uh, other robots, which are the cells themselves. And obviously, biological cells on their own are extremely complex machines. So a xenobot is an example of a robot that's made up of a bunch of robots. Um, there's a field of modular uh, robotics that's been working on this for a long time. One of the nice things about building robots out of cells is you sort of get this property uh, for free. So for, for those of you that have ever worked with robots, you know that usually if you design them to do something and then build them in reality, they usually do less than what you expected. If you build robots out of living materials, for better or for worse, they often do more than what you would expect them uh, to do. They're super capable. Here's another, um, here's another hint of where this technology might go, again, many years from now. Um, we selected for fast forward travel, and the evolutionary algorithm in this case discovered that uh, hollow solutions are good because that reduces drag. So it produced this hollow uh, xenobot. After evolution, we place this uh, yellow pellet inside and you can see it moving this pellet and keeping that pellet protected by its body. Um, there's a whole field of intelligent drug delivery. A lot of interesting work going on at the moment about creating uh, micro robots that may in the future be ingestible and be able to seek out a, a tumor somewhere in the body and deliver medication locally to that tumor. One of the challenges about ingesting micro robots is one of the things that the human body hates above all else are small bits of metals in the body. So xenobots are kind of interesting because it suggests that we may be able to create micro robots out of living tissue that um, subvert the immune response of the, the human patient, that the human patient's body may recognize a xenobot as self rather than, than other. That's again just a very basic idea of where we might go with this uh, technology in future. Um, one other capability that you get for free uh, out of uh, Xenobots is um, if they are subjected to unexpected situations, like in this case, a grievous injury. Doug is reaching in and is cutting the Xenobot almost in half. And over uh, a couple minutes, you can see that it spontaneously uh, self repairs and given enough time, it will actually form, uh, uh, it'll re reform this uh, damaged material. As we are all well aware, if you cut your laptop almost in half, it's unlikely to continue on with function. So uh, that might be another uh, useful application of these machines is that we don't need to program them to recover from unanticipated situations. They, because these are made up of cells and cells have four and a half billion years of experience of dealing with unexpected situations and trying to recover as individuals and groups, we can exploit that deep experience if we build machines out of cells. 
Okay, I've got one minute left and then I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, so what I presented is this idea of computer designed organisms or computer evolved organisms, if you like. Um, all of the, the xenobots that you saw here were not genetically uh, manipulated. Um, so I think this would be a useful complementary uh, technology to genetic engineering. Can we genetically engineer cells that are more amenable to being put together in novel uh, forms to produce new functions? As I've mentioned, uh, the xenobots are all created uh, by hand at the moment. Um, bioprinting and a lot of other uh, synthetic biology um, fabrication technologies are coming online, so we could try and automate. Uh, we're trying now to automate the manufacture of biobots rather than just their uh, design. I'll finish up by leaving the URL here. Um, thanks to Sam and Doug and Mike uh, for their work on this, and thanks to DARPA and NSF for uh, our financial support. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Josh. Um, so for those of you who've been listening, uh, feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A button over here. Um, and we have a great a question from Ken. Uh, what type of software do you use to simulate the voxels motion? Yeah, so the uh, simulator is called VoxCAD. Um, this was developed in Hod Lipson's uh, group, uh, who's now at uh, Columbia. So if you Google uh, VoxCAD, you can find a version of it. Um, we now have a version called VoxCraft, which we've uh, ported to GPUs. So if you have access to a GPU cluster and you really want to throw some computational effort at this, we'd love to, uh, to work with you on getting uh, VoxCraft up and running for you. Great. Uh, the next question from Jamal, what did the, does the decision making process look like when testing against a myriad of performance factors? Yeah. Would one define which factor ranks the highest? Yeah, that's a great question. Against a myriad of performance factors, um, most of uh, most of the evolutionary algorithms work that we do in my group, we're doing multi-objective optimization. So for those that aren't familiar with that, the basic idea is the computer assigns multiple numbers to any one design, um, how fast it moves, how energy efficient it is, uh, and so on. And basically, the computer will, uh, will delete solutions that are worse at both or all objectives. So if there's an individual that is less efficient and slower than another individual, it's deleted. One of the nice things about multi-objective optimization is, again, it gives you back a range of solutions. If we're selecting for speed and energy efficiency, you'll get very fast movers that expend all their energy. You get relatively slow movers, but do so in a very energy efficient manner. And that's often, you know, more benefit that that's more desirable from a fa fabrication point of view because you have a palette of designs from which to which to choose. Hopefully that answers your question, Jamal. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Next question is from Constantinos. Uh, you discard failed designs according to a build filter. Is it not possible to incorporate these three constraints to the geometry you optimize? Yeah, again, we, we have thought about that. Um, so as I just mentioned, multi-objective optimization is great, but if you incorporate three or more objectives, you get into many objective optimization. And there's a lot of computational problems with trying to design things simultaneously against three or more design objectives. So we tried to keep our number of objectives as small as possible and hope that we just got enough designs that we could push them through this, this flow chart and basically filter after the fact. But again, I think there, there actually are some interesting um, new many objective optimization methods that would allow you to do away with this after the fact filtering process. Yes. So that leads to one of my questions that I had. Yeah. What is your most exciting learning optimization approach this month? Like, what what's the hot, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's the hot objective uh, optimization uh, solver that you are excited to learn about I, and apply to these problems? Yeah, I guess we're kind of old school. I I've been working in evolutionary algorithms for twenty years, and some of the older ones work the best. Um, we tend to use one that was uh, created by Mike Schmidt and Hod Lipson called Age Fitness Pareto Optimization or AFPO. One of the nice things about AFPO is uh, it allows you to maintain diverse solutions within the same population rather than having to do many, many runs and have very little variety inside the same population. It is also a nice algorithm because it has very few hyperparameters. If you've, you've ever worked with optimization methods, you know that they have a lot of hyperparameters or a lot of knobs to tune. <laughs> I still like AFPO. AFPO is, I think, 10 years old at this point. It has very, very few hyperparameters. 
and it gives you a diverse set of, of good designs. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have three more questions. I think we'll have time to answer them, but um, Ioana is next at uh, 12.30, so we'll um, try and answer as whatever we can. Uh, the next question is from Dylan. Uh, when you use the evolutionary design approach, do you ever see solutions that don't walk or crawl, but express other types of locomotion, like rolling or flipping out of plane? You mostly see rolling and flipping out of plane. Again, if you've ever tried to train to train a, a self-moving robot, it will find ways of moving that were not what you what you expected. Um, yeah, rolling rolling is very common. Um, rolling did not occur here because we were simulating uh, fluid flow a little bit. So we're doing low order approximations of uh, computational fluid dynamics. So rolling doesn't make sense in water, at least if you need to move relatively uh, quickly. So yeah, flipping out a plane, not so much. But if we're doing things that move on land, um, those are most of the solutions that we got. Well, in, in this particular application, I thought the, the evolution of hollow designs was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, that was something I hadn't seen before, but of course, in retrospect, kind of makes sense. So you could imagine exacting or adapting this, the hydrodynamics of these solutions to apply them to other problems like efficiently transporting material through, through soils or, or water. I think that, that could be an interesting thing to explore. Great, so the next two questions are somewhat related to each other and yeah. it also kind of fits with my question sure. on, um, you know, given the name, the top, the name of this symposium, yeah. how do you, or what, what, what would be your ideal approach towards kind of approaching, uh, you know, merging the, the quantitative, the, the, you know, increasing voxel count making things more manufacturable and potentially utilizing things like bioprinting or other types of tissues, uh, specifically, you know, stimuli responsive materials, yep. uh, like the kind we've seen in, in previous sessions. So what, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like I said, I, I'm mostly on the computational side. So that's part of the reason why I'm excited to, to be at this symposium is I'm, we're also looking for collaborators. Obviously, there's lots of different technologies we could use. Um, I'm personally agnostic to a particular type of technology. Again, my, my Tufts colleagues could probably speak better to the question of what particular technology they're favoring for manufacture. But on the computational side, what we'd like to do is include an additional design desiderata, which is, desideratum, which is manufacturability. So we, we can obviously produce designs that are more amenable to the particular technology that's at use. and it, at least in theory, it should be relatively easy to rework the objective function if a new type of bioprinting or, or assembly technology is brought online. So I apologize, I don't have a specific technology to, to suggest, but I think, again, out, even outside of Xenob uh, Xenobots, I think there's a lot of interesting work on evolving uh, designs that, that help manufacture themselves given the opportunities and limitations of whatever the fabrication process is. Great. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you, Josh, for um, joining us today. Uh, 